be a sponge, and then bring the juice. By focusing on your improvement, by focusing on your progress, and eliminating any fixed mindset that you may have, and acts of perfectionism, then you encourage your own mastery. On some level, we do what we want to do 24 hours a day. Now, sometimes it may not seem like that, like, but if I'm choosing to work instead of sleep, what I'm actually saying is, keeping my job is more important than sleeping. I'm tired of this. Like, it's just like, I'm tired of getting beat. What can I do to, to get over this hump? So mentally, that's when I kind of put that, that forefront, like, hey, it's either all or nothing. I, I, I like to put failure in quotations because I don't believe that failure is true failure if you're looking at it with the right mindset. The truth is the journey to greatness is hard. It takes time, it takes effort, it takes focus, and every day you have to decide what you value, what you want to pursue, and what you want to achieve. And if you dig deep enough, if you push hard enough, we all have what it takes to be great. Welcome to the Edge of Greatness. Hello and welcome back to another episode of the Edge of Greatness podcast. I'm your host, Charles Schultz, and today I have with me a very special guest, Carl Mecklenburg, former Denver Broncos captain and all-pro linebacker, 12-year NFL career, six-time Pro Bowl selection, four-time all-pro all first team, and then the Denver Broncos Ring of Fame inductee. And now what I'm really excited about is some of the stuff you're doing now with the uh, being an author, keynote speaking, and the uh, recognition as a certified speaking professional. I think that's such an awesome thing to transition from a career of such high magnitude to now another professional career that just is, it's exciting to see that growth and that constant searching of, for more greatness. So thank you, Carl, so much for joining me today. It's a pleasure to have you on. Thanks, Charles. Uh, I'm, I'm a fortunate guy to, to have found two careers that I, that I love. Oh, absolutely. And, and rumor has it, you're a big seasonal ice cream fan. So I'm curious, <laughs> I'm curious, what's, what seasonal flavor have you enjoyed lately? Well, actually, uh, I was, uh, had to go down to the post office for something yesterday and stopped off at Dairy Queen and got a, uh, um, pumpkin shake thing that was really good <laughs> so, yeah. right on awesome awesome i was wondering if you had a chance to get some new seasonal flavors because I'm, I'm a big fall flavor fan myself so the pumpkin stuff has uh, got me excited um what i really want to start with is is one of your nicknames the the albino rhino i, I i'm really curious where does that come from how did that name come about yeah that came from uh, a college teammate uh back back at the university of minnesota um and he just he, he started calling me that and it just it followed me here for some, I don't know <laughs> it's yeah. funny how that happens when they go oh, for sure everywhere. and usually the 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 snow goose thing was was much worse I had too much to drink at a party at, at Augustana College and I was out in the snow drift and when I was throwing up it sounded like a goose and it followed me from there to Minnesota to, <laughs> The color, so yeah, <laughs> that's how it works with, with nicknames. Oh, absolutely. They tend to follow you everywhere. So um, you mentioned that you, uh, you got it while you were at Minnesota. I also saw that you were recently just back at Minnesota uh, giving a speech to the, at the captain's breakfast. Um, are you able to share kind of what the message was you gave those guys and how, uh, what you kind of were talking yeah. about? Yeah, they were, they ended up winning 30 to nothing. I, I don't know it. if I can give away the secret, <laughs> <laughs> but, but truthfully, uh, it, they, they were out here playing uh, university of Colorado, uh, and, and coach Fleck asked me to speak to the kids, gave me 10 minutes. Um, a couple of points that I hit on, uh, my, my success. I'm, I was the 310th pick of the draft. I was, you know, not expected to make it. I only ran a four, nine 40, which isn't fast enough to play in the NFL, particularly as a linebacker. But I found out early on in my career, if you could take the first step in the right direction before anybody else does, all the angles change in your favor. Uh, the tight end can't pin you in the guard can't cut you off. The fullback can't keep you from, from getting to the line. Everything changes. And that's not just in the football field, that's in, in business, that's in uh, relationships, that's in community, that, that's, that's how it works. And uh, I challenge the guys, you know, you're prepared going, coming in, you know what to do, allow yourself to do it. 
uh, be decisive, take that first step before the, before the bison do, <laughs> you got, you got a chance. So, uh, um, that's, that's one of the things I shared. The other thing I shared is coach only gave me 10 minutes. Normally when I'm giving a speech, I'm giving a 60 minute speech and, or, or more. And, and he only gave me 10 minutes, but you can get a lot done in 10 minutes. Actually, if you time a football game from snap to whistle, it's less than 10, 10 minutes of actual action uh, over a three hour span. And uh, none of you guys are playing both ways. So that's five minutes over three hour span. I don't care what that heat is. I don't care what that altitude is. You can do that. <laughs> so, so that was kind of my, uh, my, my message to the guys. I love that. I love the idea behind it. If, if you break it down, you can do anything in five minutes. You can last for five minutes in any type of environment. And that's pretty special. Especially, yeah. Especially over three hours. <laughs> <laughs> right. I mean, true. That's why big fat guys can play football. <laughs> there you, go. Uh, you mentioned that um, your, your draft pick status is the 12th round 310th pick. Is that correct? Correct. Yeah. Okay. Um, obviously in today's draft, that wouldn't even be a pick, right? They only have seven rounds now. And right. so what I want to know is, when you look at that and then you look at how far you came, what was it that made the difference for you? Because a lot of people see that and they go, Oh man, I'm behind the eight ball already, or my luck sucks, or this isn't a good you know, fit for me. And obviously you use that for fuel and you created an incredible career out of it. But what was it that specifically stood out for you with your mindset? How did that work for you? Yeah. Uh, desire to me, that was it. Uh, uh, I knew my, my desire, my passion, my mission for years and years before the draft was I'm going to be the greatest player that ever played the game. That's, that's what I thought about when I was working out. That's what I thought about when I was making decisions as to, you know, whether I was going to sleep or whether I was going to go, go out with the guys or what, you know, just every, every day, every step is another step closer to that desire, that passion, that mission of being the best. And, and I think a lot of people sell themselves short. I, I, I saw it all the time in the NFL. Uh, every year in training camp, they'd bring in guys who were athletically more gifted than I was. Uh, they come to come to training camp um, and 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 their desire, their passion, their mission was I'm, I'm, I, I wanted to get invited to an NFL training camp. And, and that they got invited and then they got sent home. Uh, they weren't making decisions on being better than that. So so that that daily grind of how do, how do I get closer to that desire, that passion, that mission? That was, that was it for me. Yeah. I think that's a huge thing that a lot of people, like you said, they sell themselves short. They don't look at the bigger picture. They look at, well, I want to get to this first step and they don't dream past that. Your dream was way up here. And then you had steps to get there. It sounds like along the way, and you didn't stop until that final goal was met where guys who came in, they're like, well, I made it. Well, now what am I supposed to do? Right. Wow. Right. I, yeah. There was, there was definitely a, a plan and, and I, you know, I, I'm, it was foolish to, for, for me as a, you know, as a walk on college walk on, you know, whatever 12th round draft choice and all these things to, to think that was a possibility. But if you don't think it's a possibility, it isn't a possibility. If you don't, if you don't make decisions that will get you closer to that, it's, it's just not going to happen. And, and there, there are so many, people striving for greatness that that if if you're not it's, it just doesn't happen by accident yeah I, I totally agree i think the it doesn't happen by accident is something that everyone can take because when you look at what you have to do to get there it's a daily grind it's a daily work ethic it's it's having to deal with the adversity of things because i know along your journey obviously like you said you walked on at minnesota but you also didn't start at minnesota you started somewhere else and tell us a little bit about where you started initially when you went to college and, and that kind of that story of you were offered a scholarship, not initially, but then you were promised that if you worked hard enough and performed, you'd yeah, get one. Sure. Tell us a little bit about that story, because I think that's a, a huge piece to overcoming the adversity to still find a way to forge a path. Yeah, I was not the greatest player as a kid. I, I was average. I was one of the guys, um, as a junior in high school, I played JV football. I didn't even make the varsity team. As a senior in high school, I was all state as a tight end and a defensive end, but I only was six feet tall and 200 pounds. I wasn't big enough to play major college football. So I went to Augustana College in Sioux Falls, South Dakota, a little division two school uh, in Sioux Falls on a one third scholarship. 
uh, coach came to my family's house, sat down in the living room, said, oh, it's late in the recruiting season. We only have one third of a scholarship to give to Carl. But if he per uh, participates and plays well for us, we'll bump him up to a full scholarship. So uh, I go out there. I grew three inches and 40 pounds my first year of college. Things changed. <laughs> I got pretty good. My second year there, I led the team in sacks. I played every down on defense. I was a leader on the team. Uh, I'm thinking at the end of the that uh, that season when we had that debriefing session that every coach has where he sits you down and talks about what to expect next year and what happened last year. I'm thinking that's when he's going to give me the full scholarship we talked about in my family's living room. Uh, he sat me down and the first thing out of his mouth was, Carl, uh, we know your dad's the doctor. He can afford this school. We're going to take away your scholarship and use it to bring someone else in. Now, my desire, my passion, my mission was already, I'm going to be the greatest player that ever played the game. I was already thinking that way. It just wasn't going to be at Augustana. So, uh, so I left Augustana and I walked down at the University of Minnesota. Um, when you transfer between four-year colleges, you're ineligible. You're ineligible, at least back then, now you can. Uh, but you're ineligible to play in games. You can certainly practice. And my job that year was to be a live blocking dummy. I was supposed to imitate the guy from Iowa or Michigan or whoever we're playing that week. And, and uh, if I want to eat with a team, I got to sweep up the weight room or sweep up the locker room. I mean, that, that, was, that was me. Uh, the, the, they usually put your uh, jersey number on your laundry bag. The number on my laundry bag was number 114. <laughs> you know, 114 in football, but that was me. Uh, but it didn't matter. I, I, had, I had a mission. I had a vision. And uh, as soon as I was eligible for a scholarship, they gave me one because I was, I was eating their starters up in practice. So, uh, yeah, it was, uh, to me, to me, success is overcoming obstacles on the way to your dreams. That, that's what it is. If, if you're not running into obstacles, you're not pushing hard enough. You should run into obstacles. Um, I, I uh, to this day, uh, am, am pushing. And I'm, you know, I'm over 60 and whatever. I, mean, I get up in the morning and, and think about what I can do and how I can take another step forward. Yeah, no, and I, I think that's a huge lesson for everyone is that especially when you like something or you love something or you're passionate about it, you put yourself out there. But when you put yourself out there, obstacles are bound to form because you're in the unknown. You're walking through areas that are, are not comfortable for you. You're trying new things. You're not afraid to get and put yourself out there, which leads me to my next question for you is when you first ever had a speaking engagement, uh, I remember hearing you say it was with uh, one of your teammates. You were asked to come and give a speech. Uh, you were what, about to play the Seattle Seahawks. And you yeah. were asked to the National uh, Natural History Museum, right? Sure. Um, that first experience for you, can you tell us a little bit about what it was like putting yourself out there and, and what that was, what was going through your mind and how that felt for you? Yeah, that was a challenge. Any anytime you have uh, you try new things, it's a challenge. That's that's why uh, it's so hard to do. Uh, people uh, have have really been struggling with this COVID thing. And I think the, the main, the main problem that they're dealing with, other than obviously loss, if you're losing personal friends or family, um, is, is all the change, all, you know, the, the constant and, and the force change, you're not making that decision. Now, the, the kind of change that I, I like to talk about is opportunity change, taking advantage of opportunities, uh, and, and seeing that it's an opportunity and, and, and jumping on that and, and, and changing. So I had this opportunity to speak at uh, the Museum of Natural History in Denver, um, and and I was afraid. I'd never gotten up in front of a group to speak before, and I I grew up in Minnesota. In Minnesota, when the Vikings make the playoffs, um, people panic because <laughs> they, they messed up in the playoffs or the Super Bowl or whatever so many times. It's just broken people's hearts over the years, and I and I thought it was going to be that way in Denver, but it wasn't. Uh, people were excited about it. They're painting their houses orange. There's a, a whole generation of children named John Elway Wilson or John Elway Smith. So, so the Museum of Natural History took advantage of this and, and called the Broncos. And the Broncos assigned me and our running back at the time, a guy named Sammy Winder, to go down and speak at this thing. And, and I had the choice, but I, I said, yeah, I'll, I'll give it a shot. And so I went down there and it wasn't a very big crowd, but they were all wearing their Bronco stuff, right? Their jerseys and their pom poms and their, their foam fingers and stuff. And I, you know, they were excited. It was a good, good group to give it to. And, and Sammy got up and did a great job. He talked about how John Elway was going to throw the ball and how Riley Odoms and Rick Upchurch were going to catch it and how many points we're going to score. And the, the fans are getting excited. It's my turn. And 
I get up and I start talking about how uh, how Louis Wright and Steve Foley are going to intercept the ball and Randy Gratishar and Tom Jackson tackle the running backs and myself and Roland Jones sack the quarterback and the fans are getting more excited. I'm thinking, wow, this is okay. You know, I like this. And then it's time for the Seahawks. And, and, and I had talked to Sammy when I came in and asked him what was going to happen because I got there a little bit late, right? The, the museum is downtown and I didn't get downtown much. And there's all these one way streets down there. And, um, you know, I, we, we went in there. And, and uh, so anyway, I was a little late. And so Sammy explained to me that he was going to get up and talk. And then it was my turn. And then the lady was going to hand us a Seahawk because we're playing the Seattle Seahawks. So she's going to hand us a Seahawk and we're supposed to tear it up. I figured I could do that. And it wasn't a very big crowd, like I said, but, uh, but things went well up to that point. And then, so it's time for the Seahawk and the lady hands Sammy the Seahawk and he holds it up over his head and says, Carl, you're the defensive player. You tear it up and gives me this thing. Now, if you've been to one of those museums or seen the movie night at the museum, you know, the, the diorama glass enclosure inside of there is a featured animal in the whole environment that animal lives in right down to the grass and the ants and the grasshoppers and everything's very lifelike well this bird looked like it'd come out of a shoebox its wings were pinned to its side it had feathers sticking out it was crunchy in my hands i figured they don't need this thing so i held it up to the side of the room and said this is what we're going to do to the seahawks i told you i'm from minnesota right and in minnesota if someone says tear it up they mean tear it up so sammy's from mississippi and I found out later in Mississippi Ebonics, tear it up can mean like tear up the town, tear up the dance floor, wrestle around. Be, I ripped this bird in half. I threw it half to the ground. I tore the head off the other half. I threw it out in the crowd. The crowd's going crazy. I'm thinking, I love public speaking. This is for me. And, and, and then I saw the lady in charge of the thing. And she had her head in her hands. You couldn't believe what I just The Seahawk was actually an osprey part of an ongoing study of the osprey species where they collected one every year. The crunchy osprey that was spread on the ground in front of me had been collected in 1910. I got hate mail from the Audubon Society. My parents read about it in USA Today. That, that, was, that was an interesting phone call from my mom. <laughs> As I'm leaning in the, leaving the scene of the crime, they're announcing, whoever caught the head of the Seahawk, please bring it back. You'll get free passes to the IMAX theater. So, so that's the courage to try new things, even though they might go terribly wrong. Um, and uh, I think a lot of people short themselves by not allowing themselves to try new things because somewhere along the line, something went wrong, whether it's a relationship thing, a business thing, a, a sports thing, what, it, it, it's okay. You, you, you fail, you, you, you figure out what went wrong, you, you set some goals around that, you fix it, you, and you move on. I mean, obviously, I could have arrived on time, talked to the person in charge, understood that I wasn't supposed to rip the bird to shreds, <laughs> and things would have been fine, but I didn't. And, and from now on, I show up late. I show, show up early. I never show up late. I make sure I'm, I've already talked to the people ahead of time. I did, you know, it's it's but you, you got to have the courage to try new things. Uh, I never played linebacker in my life until my third year in the NFL. Uh, the Broncos uh, came to me before that uh, third season and said, Carl, we love what you're doing as a third down pass rush and a special teams player, but we think you can help the team more if you switch to linebacker. And it's a very different job. A linebacker's on his feet. A linebacker's got to have a uh, great peripheral vision and see everything that's going on where that lineman, his hand is on the ground. He's staring at the ball. I mean, that's, that's all he sees. Or if it's a reading defense, he sees the nose of the guy lined up across from him. That's all he sees. So as, as a linebacker, I got to make sure that guy who's staring at the ball, if anything changes, I got to let him know. Right. So, so um, it was, it was a different job. And, and, and I, I said, all right, I'll give it a shot. And uh, you know, my, the 10th game of that year, I ended up starting, uh, our starter got hurt. I played six games for the Broncos that year as a, as an inside linebacker. The seventh was in a pro bowl as an all pro linebacker. I had the courage to try and I believe God's given each and every one of us more potential, more possibility than we can use in a lifetime. But along with that, we've got free will. It's up to us to have the courage to try new things. If you're going to find your own greatness, if you're going to find the greatness, uh, that's, that's already in you. Uh, you've got to have the courage to try new things. Yeah, no, I, I love I love that story. And I love the the willingness to put yourself out there. And I'm curious, after that experience, 
Did you ever think that you would get into a career of public speaking after? <laughs> uh, I actually did enjoy it until, you know, until things blew up. <laughs> um, and yeah, obviously I had the courage to try it again and again, and, and it didn't always go perfect. It doesn't. Uh, but I've, uh, through that, I've, I've been a professional speaker for longer than I was a professional football player. That's what I do. Uh, I do about 40 keynotes a year all around the country. I was just in Scottsdale doing one uh, for the American Foundry Association. Um, had had another one up in Steamboat here for the who was it? It was the uh, Colorado Motor Carriers, Carriers Association. Uh, you know, I, I'm I'm running around still doing that, even though it's COVID is going. I got I got got some more traveling ahead of me here shortly. But but yeah, it's uh, I love it. Uh, I can I can hopefully um, inspire people not only from a personal standpoint and that's where it starts but also from a team standpoint the, the you can accomplish so much more as a team than you can as an individual and and yeah there's 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 really important um things you can do uh to 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 move closer and closer to your greatness as a as an individual but but if you really want to be great it's going to be as a team. It's going to be with with others all heading in the same direction because there's there's a multiplying power to that. Now, have you always had this courage to try new things or is this something that you developed over time as you got older? Is this something that you were always kind of drawn to be like, oh, that looks interesting. I'll try it. Or is it more oh, no. as you got older? <laughs> yeah, no. And and I still fight it. Oh, yeah. I I I. Uh, I had a I spoke at the um, speaker summit, the annual uh, world speaker summit, and this one was in South Africa. And so we brought brought the family over to South Africa and took this tour of the of, of the of the back country in South Africa. Uh, so we're we're out with our guide, a guy named Philly Mon, who's uh, driving this truck, and we're sitting in the back of the truck. They got these uh, benches set up in the back of the truck, kind of a. Uh, almost like a stadium seat thing so you, everybody can see and you're riding around and just stay in the truck because you look like a big animal in the truck and the other animals won't eat you if you get out you, there's trouble so so he's going the door and we're seeing the elephants and the giraffes and all this stuff and guy finds a hippo and i guess hippos were no i'm sorry he found a rhino and rhinos are kind of rare there so he's calling his buddies pulls his phone out and and, and flips it open and calls his buddies and he's got the exact same phone as, as me <laughs> and I, I had not upgraded the phone for years and years he had the old flip phone thing right now i know they're new new thing now right but back then that was the old old version and and i I, that that was what finally kicked me over the top to upgrade my phone. So no, I don't do new things all the time. <laughs> that's that's something I have to remind myself, and I think everybody does because it's not comfortable. Even if you've had success doing it, still, um, it's still a challenge. You you are going to bump into obstacles. You're going to run into problems, uh, but you're also going to take a step forward, um, and, and you're going to you're going to catch catch up or keep up with technology catch up or keep up with the direction the world is going and 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 if and if you don't do that you're left behind uh dan reeves used to used to say about once a year at, at one of our meetings somewhere along the line it'd be man you're either getting better or you're getting worse you can't stay the same and, and that's true i mean you you cannot stay the same and, and if you want to stay the same it ain't gonna work <laughs> you're gonna start getting worse so you're gonna you're gonna fall behind and and so yeah that courage to try new things is huge do you think that your motto and your belief in change is inevitable helps you take on those challenges or helps will help others maybe take on that challenge because i've heard sure. you mention several times like the change is coming you're gonna see change it's gonna happen i think that yeah. opens the door for you I think you're right. I think I think that's true. Um, and and yeah, I mean, they're, they're, that's that's what the world is, right? It's constant, constant change. Um, those who go into every day already having spent some time thinking about what's important to them, the direction they're going, what what uh, what their desires, their passions, their missions are, who they're going to run into that day, how they can help them, how how they can take a step forward that day, they have a chance to be decisive. And like I said uh, earlier on in this interview, that's that's what allowed me to be successful is that decisiveness is is that I'd go in, I'd be prepared enough to um, 
take advantage of opportunity when it, when it arose and, and not afraid to, to try new things, not afraid to, uh, to take a step in the right direction and, uh, rather than just sit, sit pat. What advice would you give somebody who's maybe struggling with the changes that are happening now in the world, in the society that we're living in to help them understand like, look, you can't control that. Where, where can we go from here to help them maybe try something new, I guess, and and move the needle in the right direction instead of feel like we're stuck. Yeah, sure. Charles. When, when this COVID thing started, I remember thinking I've never experienced anything like this before. This, this is uh, this is unprecedented in my life. And then I started thinking about it and, and I thought about the times I was injured in, in my football career. And, and I'm in the training room. Everybody else is working out and getting ready for the season. And, and I'm in the training room just trying to walk, right? I'm, I, I, I've, I've had another knee surgery or shoulder surgery, or whatever. I've had 18 football related surgeries, right? Uh, and and uh, what I did is I controlled what I could control. What was in my power, I controlled. I, I was a model uh, rehab patient. I, I was making connections in that training room that I, I did, hadn't made before. See, a football team, even a pro football team, has its little cliques. The old guys hang out with the old guys. The young guys hang out with the young guys. The white guys hang out with the white guys. The offense hangs out with the offense. What, however, the Southerners hang out with the Southern. I, it, it, it's, there's just all these little groups. And, and uh, if you're going to be a captain, if you're going to be a leader, which I was on that team, you got to be able to cross those lines. And, 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 I, and I worked at it. I, cr- I crossed those lines during those times uh, when, I, when I couldn't do the physical things I needed to do to, to be a football player. So I took advantage of that time um, in, in a positive way, controlling what I could control. And, and I think that's the key. When, when, uh, when everything's falling around falling apart around you and and like this covid thing and depending obviously on what uh business you're in but but you know things are blowing up all over the place what can you can control what can you do how, how can how can you there there is always opportunity and change change isn't always um change isn't always uh progress but progress is always change right so, so this change is happening. How can it become progress for me? How can it become progress for my family? How can it become progress for this team? Uh, so, so for me, that, that's, that's what I try to find when I'm in these situations. So what are some of the things that you've done to adapt to the changes that are going on around you? Obviously, you're still speaking now in person, but for a while that probably was shut down. So yeah, what did I, you do I, to adapt? I did some Zoom stuff. I, I've, I'm doing a lot more podcasts. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah, I'm, 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 uh, I actually started writing a new book. Um, I've, I've done some things, uh, that, that, have been, and, and truthfully, I've spent a lot more time with my family. Uh, and, and that's, that's been good. Um, once again, it's, it's, uh, it wasn't my choice, but when change happens, take advantage of that change. Yeah, no, I love that. Cause I, I found myself hanging out and spending more time with my family, when they shut down the gyms and they shut down the, my work and they had me staying at home and it was nice. I mean, it was, it was hard because I'm used to being busy and I'm used to doing work and I'm used to being out in the world and doing things. But I, that time is, it was, it was awesome. It was special. It was, it was good to be around them and see that. And, you know, it, it's, it's like you said, if you look for it, you can use it for a positive, you can control what you can control and then it doesn't affect you as much. I think yeah, that's true. At least, at least you can, uh, for me, I, I just want to um, feel like I've done something positive today. I'm, I'm I lost 30 pounds. I, I've, 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 you know, had more time in, in my basement gym and running and stuff. And, and uh, you know, my dog's really well trained. <laughs> I know my wife again. I mean, there's some good stuff. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. Now, earlier you were talking about the um, being a captain and, and I'm curious because Again, where you came from, you know, walking on 12th round pick, not being a linebacker, moving and being like, in my opinion, you're probably the first hybrid player to exist because you played all seven positions along the defensive line and the linebacking core. And that's unique for your era. Talk to me about your journey to becoming a captain or being named a captain and and what that was like for you. Yeah, it it meant a lot to me, truthfully. Um, I... 
one of the challenges of playing all seven defensive front positions is every time the coach is moving me around, he's moving me around for a reason. He thinks that's the point of attack, right? So basically what he's saying is we think Carl's better than you. <laughs> Get out of the way. <laughs> and, and to, to uh, try to do that in a way that was um, honoring of their skill set and not, you know, um, braggadocious or how, however you want to put it. Uh, I was just doing what I could do to help the team win. And I better make the play if I'm in that other guy's position, right? So, so um, that being in that situation and then having my teammates say, we think you're a captain on this team. That, that's, a, that's a pretty amazing thing for me. Um, cause, cause yeah, there could be hard feelings there. There, uh, you know, it's the same thing if, if you're at work and, and, and you're working alongside five people and, and they say, okay, uh, there's an opening for, for this new manager's job. Uh, we want, we choose you. And, and then all of a sudden these other four people that you were working right alongside and they were doing everything you were doing. Uh, how, how do you, how do you approach them? Well, yeah. with, with humbleness, with, with respect, with uh, ability to, uh, to uh, try and put them in situations where they can succeed. Um, so, so yeah, that, that was my, uh, that, that was my kind of a idea about, about being named a captain. It was a, it was a cool thing. Yeah, no. And I, and I think you're right with, with today, for people who aren't athletes and don't get to feel the sports environment. Like we, I mean, I played baseball in college. You obviously played 12 years in the professional ranks. There's so much you learn about interacting with people and leadership and team organizations in those team environments that I think a lot of times the business world loses and they don't see all that. And so learning how to interact with somebody who was a peer and now you're seen as a captain and you now have the ability to kind of more or less lead them or tell them how we should be doing certain things and living the standard in the culture, I think becomes challenging for a lot of people. And so learning how to be humble in those situations, learning how to approach that, I think is valuable. So what would you tell people who find themselves now in a position, let's say they've been working somewhere and they're leading people who they consider friends uh, yeah. because that's challenging. I think that's hard. It sure, it sure is. And, and I look at, uh, I look at leadership as, uh, as a bunch of C's, the letter C. Uh, clarity and consistency of the cornerstones of your organization. So uh, for the Broncos under Pat Bowen, it was uh, we're here to serve Bronco country, serve the community and, uh, and to win championships. That, that's, that was the team's desire, passion, mission, uh, the cornerstones. Um, clarity and consistency of the commitment. And the commitment when you sign on with the Denver Broncos was we're here to win each game. We're going to prepare to win each game. So that's the short term. We're going to we're going to do everything we can to, to play. And, and you know, if, if I'm hurt and, uh, you know, we're playing a team that's not very good, but uh, our commitment is to win each game, I'm going to play if I can play. That that was that was the the understanding. Every, everything was was uh, narrowed down into one week segments. And so that that was our commitment. Clarity and consistency of the commitment, and then clarity and consistency of connection, and that that piece is is huge. Um, the the ability to uh, to cross lines, um, like I said, between uh, old guys and young guys, and offense and defense, and black and white and whatever um, in the NFL is is huge uh, because it when you have a group of fifty people, it breaks down into little pieces. That's just how, how it works. And if you're going to lead that made a bunch of little pieces you've got to be in all of them and i remember watching john elway in our in our lunchroom and john would uh everyone else would it was like a middle school lunchroom but same people sat at the same table every day right except john john would sit at a different table every day and i asked him about that uh, when he was sitting at my table <laughs> and uh and he said uh, he was connecting with his teammates and he'd sit down and he'd talk about, if he knew what you like to do, he'd always talk about uh, playing. Uh, he'd always talk about hunting and fishing with me or, uh, you know, guys, some guys like to play cards. So he'd talk about playing cards with them, whatever. 
you like to do. And, 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 and it eventually would work back to what happened last week, what's going to happen next week. Uh, you know, our desire, our passion as a team, our cornerstone of, of winning championships. And it was clear and it was consistent and he was interested. And if the offensive linemen were going out drinking, he was with them. And if the, if the Christians were going to Bible study, he was with us. And if, you know, it would, that was, that was John and, and it made him a great leader. Uh, and that, that connection, that understanding, to me, what a great leader can do is take the strengths of the individual and use them to help the team and use the strengths of the team to cover for the weaknesses of the individual. Now, how can, how can you do that if you don't know the individual, if you're not connected with the individual? Uh, that's how a team becomes great uh, because everybody's looking out for each other. No, I love that. And I, and I like hearing about John Oway. I'm, I'm going to be honest with you here. I'm a Browns fan. So this was, this was one of those moments for me where I'm sure my dad's going to listen to this and go, really, Charles, you brought on a guy who played against the Browns during the, uh, the drive. And I'm like, I got to make sure I mention that at some point during this, but um, what was it like being on a championship team like that? Obviously this is going to hurt a little bit hearing about how you took down my brownies, but I, I want to know what, what was that team like? How was it different than some of the other teams you were on to be able to overcome the obstacles, to make it to the pinnacle of the game, and be able to play for a championship. I, I think there's something special that happens when those moments occur. And I'm curious to hear what your thoughts are on how that became possible for you guys. Yeah, Charles, it, um, we weren't, we weren't the most athletically gifted group. We really weren't, uh, one, one of those Super Bowls, uh, and I believe it was the first one. So it was the drive one. Uh, Sammy Winder was the only guy we had in the Pro Bowl one of those years that we went to the Super Bowl and, and he was in the Pro Bowl as a alternate because the guy who was supposed to go got hurt or something happened. So, so we weren't, we weren't that team. Uh, we weren't the, you know, the, just the, the bunch of superstars coming together. Uh, we were a team. We relied on each other. We, uh, we played conservative football. We, uh, you know, we, we weren't taking a lot of chances. We were doing whatever we could to help each other. And when the time came to make a big play, uh, we'd make it. Uh, and, and whether it was a defensive play or whether it was a, uh, an offensive play, uh, you know, or special teams, we, we, we were a very solid team, but we weren't a spectacular team. Um, and and uh, it was a fun thing to be a part of because we all relied on each other so much. Yeah, it, sound, it sounds like that was the strength to you guys is that you didn't have to lean on one person to be the, the leader in a particular game. You had everyone trying to do what was best for the unit. And I think that speaks volumes to the growth that you guys were able to put something special together is that you didn't, it doesn't sound like you had the egos. You didn't have the, the person trying to be the star all the time. It had a bunch of guys who were out. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm sure as a pro, everyone wants to be the star, but. Yeah, no, you're right. No, it, 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 um, it was about the team. Uh, it, and and that's that came from the top. I mean, when Pat Bowen bought the team, he bought the team from a, a guy named Edgar Kaiser. Edgar is a financier out of Canada who didn't really know a lot about football. Um, really, if I'd have passed him on the street uh, when when I was playing for him, I don't think he'd have recognized me as one of his employees. Uh, and, and Pat bought the team, and things changed. Uh, he he. Um, put those cornerstones in place of winning championships and, and serving the community. Uh, he was everywhere all the time. He knew my wife's name and my kids' names and, you know, knew who I was, obviously, and, um, and, and was that way with everyone in the building. Whether you were a, a janitor or his star quarterback, uh, he was interested and he was, he, he was connected with you. Um, and, and the connection piece, if, 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 and, and he, they did it every year. They asked Pat, you know, well, what's your record going to be this year? How, what do you think about the team? Oh, at 16 and 0, right? We're committed to win each game. That was it. And if we'd lost a couple of games, 14 and 2, I mean, that, that was it. That, that's what he expected. That's what, he, what, what his vision of us was. And, 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 and because he had that vision as a leader um, and as a connected leader, uh, it trickled down and, 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 and it, it became part of the fabric of that, of that organization. Even when he was gone, um, there were a couple of times when Gary Kubiak was a head coach where, uh, you know, at the end of the season, it would probably have behooved us to lose games. So we'd move up in the draft rankings. No, we're, we're committed. We're here to win each game. And like he wouldn't play uh, the 
the the rookie quarterback because the rookie quarterback sucked and <laughs> want to lose the game because we're here to win each game. Or there was one situation where uh, it, the we we're playing the Chiefs and it's tied and we're kicking a like a sixty yard field goal to try and and win this thing. Or we can punt and and pin them in and we're going to end up with a tie, right? If you kick the 60 yarder, I was, and they got only 40 yards more to go. Right. So, but no, we went for it. We kicked for the 60 yarder because that's who we were, right? you can be that commitment. So, so it, it carried on past to even his lifetime of, of leadership. I think that's such a valuable thing is when you can put pieces in place that live beyond your years. I think that's such a strong leadership quality that I think is very special. And obviously it's, it shows in what, the Broncos organization's all about and how they play the game. And, and it's very, a kind of a special thing to see. Uh, even as a Browns fan, I can appreciate that. So <laughs> um, well, Carl, good right now, <laughs> yeah, they are. It's finally, I've been waiting a long time. <laughs> so, uh, but Carl, thank you so much for taking time with me today. What I want to do now is give you an opportunity to share where uh, my listeners might be able to connect with you. If they're looking for somebody to come and speak to their organization or uh, anything that you want to put out there for them to kind of connect with you and what you got going on. Sure. Yeah. Uh, you can go to carlmecklenburg.com. Uh, you can misspell it a few ways, but Carl's with a K <laughs> and, uh, that's, that's probably the best place to go. I'm on Facebook. I'm on LinkedIn. I'm on, uh, uh, Twitter. All of them are just Carl Mecklenburg, uh, okay. spelled correctly though. Yeah. <laughs> I'll, uh, two RG at the end. Uh, yeah. And, and yeah, I'd love to hear from your listeners. Um, and, and uh, you know, whether they just want to want to, you know, just have a conversation or uh, whether they're interested in, in having me out to speak for their group. Every every speech is tailored for that organization. It's all story based. You already heard some of the stories and uh, and, and I love it. I, there's the thing I miss most from football is the adrenaline. That's really the hardest thing to replace. And uh, um, I, I get that adrenaline getting up in front of a big group to speak. So that, that's, that's that's awesome. Fun. Oh, that's awesome. And I'll, I'll make sure I put everything in the show notes for you so that you can connect with you. Uh, thank you so much again for taking time with me today. It's been a real pleasure. I've enjoyed the conversation a lot. Thanks, Charles. Take care now. Absolutely. As always, guys, keep reaching for the stars. Fall flat on your face. But remember, whenever we fall, always get up. Thank you for joining us today on the Edge of Greatness podcast. If you haven't yet, please take a minute now to subscribe and review our show. Join us again next week as we continue to dig deeper into the key components of greatness. The path to greatness is never linear, so remember to keep pursuing greatness no matter what. Keep stretching your abilities, reach for the stars, and fall flat on your face. But remember, no matter what happens, whenever we fall, always get up. Until next time, I'm Charles Schultz, and this was the Edge of Greatness Podcast.